Hey, thank you very much for coming. Very welcome to this house. This is an event organized by Spy 25 in conjunction with ARTES, which is the Amsterdam Research School for Transnational and European Studies. And we're very happy to have Dr. Alexander Bogomolov here, who is the head of the National Institute of Strategic Studies. I have known him as an Orientalist, as a fellow Orientalist Arabist, as a specialist on the Middle East, uh, and on Muslims in Ukraine. So I knew him first as a specialist for the Tatars, and Crimean Tatars living in Ukraine, of course, very central to the topic that we're discussing here. And then he worked on the Middle East in the Arab Springtime and worked on Arabic manuscripts, uh, sorry, Arabic publications on, um, on, on the language of Arabic intifada, Arabic revolution, and the way how democracy is being used in an Arabic kind of idiom, in an Islamic form. Um, at the same time, we have a discussion, that is Dr. Suda Raj Rajagopalan, she is uh, working here at the university in the section of European studies, in the Eastern European studies part, a specialist for Soviet culture and for media studies and media communities in present-day Russia. In her work, the war is also very central when it comes, for instance, to using arts as a protest to the war in Russia proper. Our aim is to have a presentation by Dr. Bogomolov for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes perhaps, with slides. Uh, after that, Suda will have a couple of questions, and we will be short on that because we hope that we have a lot of questions from the public, from the audience. That is, we will stimulate you, not just the students who are specially invited for this uh, occasion, but uh, also everybody else. Uh, I will try to moderate that. We also have a fan community, so to say, online. 150 people signed up for this event, which is a fabulous kind of result. So thank you very much, Alexander, for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I appreciate very much an interest into what's going uh, what's going on in my country. And I'm here to try and explain, in fact, and uh, try and help them to understand, you know, uh, how and what is really happening. Uh, so my focus in what I, uh, I will be trying to say is uh, specifically on understanding, you know, because there is so much literature nowadays. There is a whole flow of information that has been flooded in the media, the expert discussion, the academic and semi-academic discussion in various circles, uh, in various uh, specific uh, professional areas, including the military, the political, the diplomatic, the uh, you name it. And it is really very difficult and a challenge to me to speak because I'm used, uh, I'm an academic person, as Mike said, and uh, it's uh, a very different story when you, ha you have to make a presentation about a, so a social, a political, and um, actually physical, uh, a multidimensional phenomenon such as war, especially when you are uh, not just observing it from afar, which I did with a great interest. Uh, when I was focusing on certain Middle Eastern processes, such as the war in Syria, for instance, specifically, I was following it very closely and commenting on that. And, but when we become part of it, and also uh, when I was doing my bit of conflict studies, I was interested in ethnic conflicts, for instance, and uh, uh, contentious politics in uh, settings such as Crimea, for instance, such as Transnistria. I did a research project uh, in both of these areas, uh, actually one research project in Transnistria and uh, multiple others in Crimea. Uh, but you read literature, you need, you know, uh, you may. Uh, I, was, I was recalling actually some, some books which I considered uh, important reference points in, uh, in my studies. And I still, I remember reading one author <laughs> who was describing the situation on the, of the onset of war. And I have experienced that myself. Now, I, I specifically remember a phrase when, uh, when the war begins, you, people start running from the war, and then the war is chasing them, and they're, they're, they are into it, just like they return, and they understand. They, they can do nothing but be part of it. I have lived this experience myself when it began in uh, February 2024, uh, as you know. Uh, speaking of myself and possibly, uh, probably appropriately about the institution that I present, I'm running a, a, a major, actually the single government-owned governmental public think tank, 
which is under the uh, office of the president of Ukraine. We report directly to the president and to the office of the president of Ukraine. We are supposed to be producing all sorts of uh, briefing papers and analysis in different areas for the consumption of the government. This is our daily business. Uh, we have four branches, uh, which we call centers. Uh, one is the uh, policy, foreign, foreign policy center, the other is domestic policy. Then the third one is economic policy, and the second, uh, the, third, the fourth, and the most important now, now center is the defense and security studies. And uh, the institution has about uh, 134 currently researchers and experts uh, with the expertise in the appropriate areas, combining both the academic expertise, some of them are academics rather than uh, governmental or public. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 yeah, but some some of them have a practical, a very practical expertise coming from uh, various branches of government. Uh, but normally they used they worked as an analyst in such branches of government. But they are also former law enforcement officers, former security officers, former military uh, from the general staff, etc. When the war began, and we uh, that was a shock for every institution in Ukraine, including ours, when we put ourselves, our, our heads together. Uh, we organized a seminar, which is uh, on a semi-weekly uh, basis, where we discuss uh, what's going on on a daily basis. Apart from that, we are supposed to produce uh, uh, a flow of various analyses, which we, I have to read. And my job would be described more appropriately as a chief editor rather than anything else, <laughs> because everything passes through me. That puts me into an interesting situation whereby I have acquired all sorts of knowledge and experience which I never actually so much cared about. You know? <laughs> and I, what, what I intend to do today is to share a bit of it uh, with you. Uh, uh, so, talking about yeah, the other, the other way around. So uh, let's talk about how do we define what's going on. Uh, the, the important things in war is how do we define the war? Wars differ. They are different. Uh, essentially, they look the same, you know, but in every situation, it is very important to define the war. What this war is about? How do we address it? And then what do we want to achieve? Our, our side, we, we need to read the enemy. We need to have a definition of the enemy, why the enemy is doing this and that, and what do we expect in short term, in long term perspective. And then every war ends with peace. It's an interesting phenomenon then, if you look up any dictionary of any language, you will find that peace is defined on the basis of war and not the other way around. Peace is a time which supposedly is normal, also very much normal in the context after the Second World War in Europe, right? There was no war. There were wars, wars everywhere, elsewhere, <laughs> in Afghanistan, you name it. In Africa, there are some war, military conflicts which are going on on a regular basis, maybe, yeah? such as in DRC, for instance, etc. And then peace still is defined. It is an important point, which I'll just leave. I'll stop at that, you know, that peace is defined as not war, but not war is defined as not peace. Yes. Here's the legal perspective. And this is the starting point which I suggest for thinking about what's going on right now. In the legal perspective, our enemy has violated every single act of international law, starting from the very uh, uh, UN Charter down to what is referred to among the experts in international law as the Declaration on the Principles of International Law very long. Usually they just abridge it to, and stop at the third word <laughs> or the fourth. In 1970, which elaborates on the UN Charter essentially, which is essentially is an instrument which totally denies the possibility of any aggressive use of military force in international relations. It's not that no one has violated this uh, important legal instrument since 1970, but it certainly never happened in Europe. <laughs> and in many other places as well, in, let's say in, in 
the Americas, you know, and it's, uh, in, many, in many parts of the world. Mostly it didn't really happen. Then there was a Helsinki final act of 1975, which essentially shaped Europe as we know it in terms of security, right? And international relations. There were also specific and bilateral and multilateral regional legal instruments. For us important is the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, whereby Ukraine uh, committed to getting rid and uh, subscribing to the non-proliferation treaty regarding the nuclear weapons. We had a, a strong arsenal of nukes, and we have committed ourselves to ridding the country of the nukes. Upon the provision of against the provision of um, guarantees by various parties, including Russia, that our sovereignty will not be violated. It was. The, then there were multiple bilateral documents, the most important of which was the so-called Friendship Treaty, or otherwise called Big Treaty, by the war in Russian. The, a treaty which goes into every detail of the bilateral relations between Russia, post-Soviet uh, bilateral relations between Russia and Ukraine. That has been violated, of course, uh, in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and when, when Russia invaded eastern Ukraine and tried to also produce uh, hybrid uh, kind of provocations elsewhere and different other places, but failed there ever since she was, uh, Russia was occupying, um, by proxy largely, the eastern Ukraine and uh, annexed directly uh, the peninsula of Crimea. Uh, Ukraine has uh, actually abrogated this because it wasn't working, this treaty. In 2018, it went out of force. And it's not... How do we define the war? Here are the three definitions that are currently used and which match also this legal understanding. This is the war of aggression. This is the war of choice, whereby that was the Russian authorities' decision to fight the war. Russia was never provoked, never threatened. But in the run-up to the war, uh, Russia has been disseminating a huge flow of information, both internal and external, accusing various parties uh, producing a narrative of uh, an immense uh, imminent threat coming from NATO, uh, which is in total contradiction, in fact, with the reality, with what was going on. It is a false claim and unprovoked aggression. That's how we legally define it uh, most often in Ukraine, in Ukrainian legal documents and policy papers. Uh, while Russians prefer to call it special military operation, even now. Although the front line uh, for the most active period of this war, uh, when they have, the, the hostilities were going on, the front line was, had a length of 1,100 kilometers. And now, because of the successes achieved by the Ukrainian armed forces, it shrank to about 800 kilometers and effectively to 500 kilometers because 380 kilometers out of this length is the water, fr uh, water, uh, waterfront line. Uh, so, in the now, uh, uh, I will say a few words about the goals. What do we do when you are confronted with the aggression of that sort, of that scale. You don't, you don't have any other choice by, but to defend your country. This is the right. This is also the right which is proclaimed by the UN Charter. There is a specific legal paragraph in the UN Charter which uh, acknowledges the right of every country for defense and also every other country to cooperate, to help, which is the legal framework of our relationship for with uh, our partner, uh, partners in the West, primarily the uh, NATO alliance and, and also a broader alliance of other countries who are not part of NATO, up to 50 countries who are helping us in various different ways. The, 
there is a story of, of course, other parts of the world. There is an understanding uh, that we have on the part of the United States, the uh, Northern American, uh, the Canada, the uh, European Union member states. Uh, uh, but we have an absolutely different reception of what's going on on the part what we describe as the Global South. The Global South is different, of course. Its perspective on what's going on is different. Uh, why it is the case? This is a much discussed issue, and I'm going to just briefly touch on that right now. Uh, the, it is an important part that uh, for the West, uh, when we talk about Russian aggression, uh, uh, the Russian aggression uh, is and was from the initial phase um, uh, so formulated and uh, essentially was a, a challenge which, which Russia put up not only against Ukraine but also against the entire European security system, against uh, their threats coming now on and off to the uh, to other member states of the uh, to the member states of the European Union that used to be part of the Soviet Union. If you remember, uh, Russia began in the run-up of this aggression. It put up an ultimatum, basically, addressed to the West that you need to pull back NATO. Uh, and also the military assets of NATO, even from the, from, the, from the countries that already became from the former Soviet bloc, they became the members of, of, of NATO, it, just like the militarized and so on. It is basically a declaration, an ultimatum demanding and a sphere of influence, broader than Ukraine itself, but Ukraine became the immediate target of this aggression. Uh, with the global West, uh, with, with, uh, the, uh, with the countries that are outside, the position is, is different. It is read differently from the perspective of global South, as you see, and I found this very good phrase that we may come back to, uh, that the uh, post-colonial identities of the countries, such as Middle Eastern countries, read what's going on from their their own perspective, and because their post-colonial identities are shaped by the struggle against European empires or against the U.S. hegemony, not against Russia or China, who they don't see as, it is very difficult, in fact, when, and I have to deal with this uh, position, you know, when I frequently comment on the Arab TV channels, what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, make them really understand that the war, uh, this war, uh, the Russian war against Ukraine, is a, a, a classical example of an imperialist colonial war. And that Russia essentially is, was, and nowadays aspires to reshape, rebuild itself uh, through this aggressive war as a colonial, essentially a colonial power. It is very difficult to explain because they have a background of knowledge that they, uh, uh, the colonial has a name. Co uh, colonialism for them has specific, specific national identities. It is very difficult to uh, help, uh, how to say, to convince people on the basis of abstract ideas. Because people really see uh, colonialism and imperialism as something with a face on it. Like the, 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 what they put up on pictures, you know, in these funny pictures like Uncle Sam, you know, or, you know, the British Empire with these uh, helmets uh, of specific uh, shape, you know. Uh, uh, therefore, uh, it is very, very, uh, really, uh, almost a, really a, a huge uh, cognitive challenge to, uh, for the uh, countries that used to be colonies of the Western powers, you know, to understand or to affiliate with, with our with our experience. Therefore, they try and to see, they, they really see this conflict as the conflict of NATO against uh, what used to be Soviet Union, because in their eyes, Russia still is Soviet Union. But it's not only about the, um, uh, it's not only these uh, countries the, of the global south, south, but also very many uh, left uh, uh, leftists in the West and etc., who, who still see Russia as a continuation of the Soviet Union of the old days, which was uh, an anti-colonial supposedly power or anti-imperialistic power, etc. So these frames are very difficult to break. Uh, it's another story, of course, with China, which I guess we probably can 
separately address. Uh, China has its own aspiration and in many different ways uh, what's going on right now is kind of uh, test for China. Uh, China is now testing the ground and seeing what's going to happen and how it will unfold. Uh, Uh, it is interesting also in the run-up to the war that the positions of the Western uh, countries, the NATO countries, uh, the most important NATO countries, is, was highly skeptical towards uh, the capability of Ukraine to defend itself. Here is quotes from various, various uh, sources, uh, 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 including uh, a German military expert who was the advisor of Merkel, uh, and um, also a few others who were very skeptical. But in, uh, in, reality, in reality, as you, you all know, Ukraine uh, proved to be uh, far more uh, capable. Uh, the military institution of Ukraine was uh, far more capable uh, than it was expected uh, to, defend, uh, to defend against Russian aggression. Um, uh, speaking about the justification, Russian justification, and the uh, relationship between uh, Ukraine and the West, Ukraine and NATO specifically, um, there is a lot of misunderstanding about what's, how it was going on and the importance of various things. Ukraine uh, has long expired since, uh, aspired since uh, becoming independent to become part of NATO and also to become part of the European Union. It is an important element of um, national rebuilding, let's say, uh, the membership of the European Union, uh, uh, the, uh, the European uh, idea, let's say, the belonging to the European culture is very important. It's, um, let's say, embedded in uh, Ukrainian national identity since, uh, since the outset, since, since the early movements for independence, even in the 19th century and the 20th century. That's one thing. Our aspiration to join NATO, of course, frankly speaking, was always security uh, uh, motivated, primarily uh, because we all know about the Article 5, which protects supposedly every um, member nation against an external aggression. It is the same motivation which was uh, behind the movement towards NATO on the part of the former Soviet, of, of, of the countries of the former Soviet bloc. They clearly joined NATO just because they. They were, uh, they, they were apprehending what is happening right now. Uh, as for Ukraine, our bid was uh, practically put on an indefinite block by primarily Germany, but also a few other countries, Hungary, etc., some others who supported this position. It was formulated in, uh, during the NATO-Ukraine summit of 2008 when we made the bid. It was said that the doors of NATO are open. It sounds like the doors of paradise, whatever. A very supposedly diplomatic and beautiful phrase, which effectively meant that no. No, why and until when and when they are open. Uh, the whole thing is defined by the position of Russia. It, of course, was prompted by the idea, by the belief shared by many, not by George Bush who tried to push for the membership of Ukraine, for the membership action plan. This idea was uh, uh, put on hold. Uh, I would describe it like that. I have invented a mantra for the understanding of this uh, relationship. Uh, Russia was, since long, seen as a problem. Post-Soviet Russia was seen as a problem. But by the West, I mean, of course, by the countries of NATO, the European Union, even by the Germans. But the policies towards this problem and the likely threat of Russia and the actual threat of Russia, which, which transpired in various many different ways, such as the uh, uh, intervention in the American elections in 2016, such as the poisoning of different personalities here and there in the killings, etc., the bribery schemes, the uh, espionage stories here and there, you know, with the clear intent which was been discussed that uh, to undermine Western democracies. This this phrase is not new. So it was seen as a threat, but against 
this backdrop, Ukraine was seen as what? As part of the problem and not as part of the solution. Therefore, our persistent attempts to change the situation and the mental landscape of Europe, Ukraine historically is part of Central and Eastern Europe. Same as Czech, same as Slovakia, who speak almost the same language, very close, clearly understandable. Uh, even better with Poles. Any Ukrainian who really knows the language can speak Ukrainian, and the Poles will speak Polish, and we understand each other. We had a discussion uh, with the uh, deputy head of uh, Bureau Bezpieczeństwa Narodowego, the Bureau of Security uh, and Defense of Poland. We have decided not to, we have uh, agreed to use English if we don't understand each other. We never need it. One and a half hours. It is part historical of this landscape, but then at some point it was snatched <laughs> by a great empire. It was snatched in pieces, not wholly. Some parts were parts of Austria-Hungary, but this is essentially the same cultural escape. And uh, when it comes to when it comes finally to the situation, dramatically, Russia, who wanted to reinstate itself as again to grab Ukraine back, and which. There's a whole history about the importance of Ukraine as opposed to other, other territories. Even Brzezinski at some point wrote that uh, without Ukraine, Russia is not an empire. So it's so deeply engraved in the psychs and the mental culture, into, in political culture, of, even of Russians in themselves. So when the war unfolded, it immediately became clear that the threat is not only of Ukraine, again becoming part of NATO, uh, of, uh, of Russia, but of this empire resurrecting itself and becoming an immediate geographically next door threat to, to the Western Bloc. This is the, the whole idea uh, behind the support that we receive in Ukraine in terms of weapons systems, which are quite advanced, etc. We can discuss it separately specifics of these weapon systems uh, yeah, and why we have this and don't have that and why we have this uncertain schedule uh, over the uh, period, various periods of war, why we didn't have this on the onset of war, we only had it later, etc. It's all like goes on a certain scheme. <laughs> there is a political ideology behind it. And uh, what's important that when, when Russia, when, uh, when uh, previously before the war, uh, this, uh, the German approach was handel doch wandel, you know, let's, like, uh, let's change Russia through cooperating with this, uh, building all these pipelines, etc. It's all failed, even the German government now in Klonsch, that we have opened up a new page. It's not a page, it's a new, new political and security reality. There is... Uh, we cannot live like that. It is very difficult, perhaps, for you who know about what's going on mostly through reading and watching then, but for us it's very palpable. We need to understand that the whole region, Europe at large, entered into an absolutely different phase. We are faced with absolutely different. This is a new world, and we don't really fully know what is it, this new world. This is an emerging reality. It's dynamic. Why Russia went to war? Why Russians are so supportive? The public opinion. Why there is practically no opposition to war? This is the psychologically very difficult and politically very difficult reality, very difficult to cope with. There are many Ukrainian families who have relatives in Russia. And these contacts, 99%, I know this from practice, from anecdotal evidence, from talking to friends, they have interrupted. There is this context. This is impossible. It became impossible to talk to each other. It became as impossible as for two parts of the German society in the 30s, one of them with a Jewish background and another one with the supposedly Aryan one, if even they were family members, to meet and talk to each other.
Russia, over three decades, but most particularly uh, intensely during the period of rule of Putin, which is, as you know, basically the, tw the 2000s, uh, was trying in many different ways to somehow reconstruct itself. But the, the whole idea about that was to regain power, to became, become as powerful as it is. Uh, in the first initial period of time, great hopes were invested by Russians into rebuilding the economy, making it more efficient. But the whole story ended up by Russia still remaining the petrol station of, the, of Europe and much of the rest of the world. It is still the country whose income is based on oil and gas and nothing much else. It has failed immensely in mod economic modernization ideology, which was perhaps most graphically uh, represented by the period of Medvedev, and most graphically failed. Now, if we start reading what Medvedev is putting up as his posts in the internet, this is the condemnation not to us, which because he addresses these points to us, but it is the condemnation to, to the ideas that he attempted to profess. It is condemnation to the project of Russian technological modernization and leadership. Russia has failed socially. I've been reading, and it so happened that I've been reading a few, a few useful books uh, for understanding what this war, you know, and one of the books that I was reading uh, right in the run-up to the war was uh, uh, an American author, uh, Mark Jurgensmeyer, <coughs> Uh, a guy who was, uh, his, uh, built his academic career around two, uh, an attempt to answer two questions. Why societies go to war? Because obviously most of the people don't want to fight if you take them individually. <laughs> and why uh, most of the wars are religious? Despite the fact that most of the preachers say that we are for peace, etc. <laughs> yeah. It apparently is the case, and now I, I, I suggest for us to come back to this idea which is in, uh, embedded in the dictionaries of every language, that war is a default. However we, our personal experience and our fears and our psychology is against this idea, but war is the simplest idea of the society. It is a situation whereby everything is so clear, like black and white. You don't like someone, you kill him. <laughs> this is the basic, this is the real basis, the, the most basic transactional scheme, if you look at this from the perspective of social, social psychology, so social dynamics. And if society, what is the human civilization society? It's about making our life more and more sophisticated and complicated and building ideology upon ideology, technology upon technology, making us happier than, uh, again, more and more, you know, and comfortable more and more, and building up a very, are we running out of time? Yeah. And here comes a situation when this whole building starts producing glitches upon glitch. This is a way by which a society, uh, Jungus Meyer suggests that to a large extent subconsciously, just pulls the plug <laughs> off. <laughs> and that's what's happened with Russia. For whatever the ideology they have produced, they just, and we are now part of the, historically speaking, because Mike is historian, I'm not a historian. <laughs> with all respect. Historically speaking, we are now in the face of the collapse of the last Eurasian empire. We had so many of them, okay? I've just visited what, what remains from the Austro-Hungarian empire, came here from Slovakia, <laughs> via Slovakia. Yeah, it's, it's now a fairy tale. We can talk about that, but Orban doesn't talk about fairy tales, right? He's very serious. So, but generally speaking, that all became history. To many Brits, it became history. To most of them, to the whole, so many empires sort of step or, stepped over that and survived. Uh, this is not the case of the Russian Empire. It ran up against the wall, and it is trying to to cure itself by making others sick. This is a very bad remedy, and it would fail. 
I was also prepared to talk about some military aspects of the, the, the war as it is, and I would be ready perhaps to address this issue in the question and answer format as well. Yeah, we are kind of interrupting, but of course interrupting in order to continue. And uh, to, thank you very much for this introduction so far, which is about the legal aspects, the morality aspects as well uh, of the warfare. And we have a lot of questions about the actual background of what's happening in Ukraine that are maybe a bit more specific. And I give the mic. Yeah. Did, are you trying to tell me you have questions? Oh, we I should. Have a lot of <laughs> All right. Well. Um, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. This is an Arab TV channel again. <laughs> I'm going to move up one chair. The global south. The global south. Yes. <laughs> We're a real pain in the side. I telephone off for a while. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, for, for, for doing this talk. And I think it's, it also struck me when I was listening to you how hard it is to talk about war when you're in the midst of it, because we're often talking about war in retrospect. Uh, but the fact that you were able to so dispassionately distill some of the main uh, aspects and I understand there's much more to be said and perhaps it'll come up in the questions uh, during the, the forum the, when, when we open it up. Um, my first question actually is, is kind of triggered by the slide that you had about peace and war. And of course peace is, as we all know, not just the absence of war. And uh, the fact that a few slides later you talked about uh, the simmering tensions since uh, the ascension of Putin, because we can only call it the ascension. Um, and I'm wondering if what you're really saying is that Ukraine hasn't been in a state of peace for two decades. And in fact, this is a war that has been imminent for so long. And much of what we are now seeing is the blindness of the West to the fact that the Ukraine, that Ukraine was facing this kind of confrontational, aggressive neighbor. So are you saying that it wasn't, the war didn't begin in 2014 or in February, but in fact has been simmering for a while because of this r persistent kind of uh, wave of hostilities and tension? Yeah, that's right, in a way, yes. Uh, uh, but we, everyone, including us, I would frankly admit, you know, uh, were trying to turn to look the other way, you know. We were re really, uh, there were so many obvious signs that uh, uh, there was a one, one mongering culture in Russia, like growing, you know, uh, it would suffice only to look, to watch for a while the Russian TV, specifically the talk shows, uh, to gauge the level of hate, the quantity of hate speeches directed specifically increasingly and particularly from 2014 towards one single they were creating an enemy that was a process which Jürgen Smyr in his books describes as making up an enemy he's used the example of the so-called Islamism you know and the global war on terror because he wrote before Ukraine Russia Ukraine war but they were they, they were really putting a huge social not of course, also material and money-wise also a huge investment into a media culture of hatred directed in a manner that the only solution, it was like, like what you call suspense in the movies, you know. They were creating a suspense for the war because the only resolution for this suspense, if you continue watching this flow of mounting hate, could only be war. And I would suggest, and even I think some of the military political analysts are uh, somehow waking up to the idea uh, of uh, taking, in, including into this uh, early warning kind of mental, you know, projects regarding the military threats, etc., the so-called cognitive aspect. You know, that was really very palpable, but still in the in the political and military culture, military expertise of these old days, and particularly for the point of view of politicians who are always, they always have the tendency to simplify the world around, you know, and to skip certain elements, you know, and to make it look more appropriate. It was a tendency on the part of our Western partners, but I would also acknowledge of many inside Ukraine to try and seem as if we are at peace. Even when we managed to put the genie to an extent into the bottle because 
in 2014, I remember myself and everyone who I knew, when waking up in the morning, the first thing that we do, we don't go brush our teeth or whatever, you know. We put on any information channel and we'll look what happened. It was like an obsession. Is, do they move in ahead? Where is the front line? There was a very palpable threat in Kiev in 2014 that the Russian um, airborne troops will come down in Kiev. And they probably were contemplating this idea. But it did happen. It did happen later. It took them eight years to do that. They did it. It's also a funny thing that nowadays when we look through this, when we, are, we somehow are not as as apprehensive, you know, because we're already into that. And to some extent, you would say it is, it is a real thing. That was an imaginary. That was more bothering than what's really happening, you know, sometimes. But that's another part of the story. But generally, yes. Because, as I said, that was something to be pushed aside. This is something going on in so-called post-Soviet space, which has a separate compartment, a box, we can either pull it or push it, you know, from the, <laughs> from the desk. And most politicians, decision makers, NATO, European Union, whosoever, they tended rather to push this, push this uh, box closed, you know, to yeah, this shelf, you know. That's how it was. Yeah, and it kind of leads me to my second question. Uh, when I read about uh, the potential for peace uh, and a resolution to the war, I'm always struck by what an unfair burden is placed on Ukraine in the way we talk about peace negotiations. So how do we talk about uh, peace and an end to the war without placing this burden on Ukraine and instead placing it on the aggressor? Because we are better. They want something from the bad, uh, good guys, not from the bad guys. Of course, if you, if you have a situation where you have a villain and, and, and the good guys fighting each other, if you want to ask something, who do you ask? Do you ask the villain? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, because there is also a partnership, a bilateral relations whereby, a relationship whereby we, um, to an extent, to a large extent, depend on this on the Western assistance, and therefore we could be uh, politely blackmailed. This is a very difficult relationship, and the difficulty is uh, that uh, we are very much on the same plate. We have a, a very strong consensus with our Western partners on many points, but not all, uh, and the the. The great difference is that the Western strategy in this conflict is to try and pretend that this is a war between two countries. Even though the only, the only, the only reason why they help us in this war is because it is not. <laughs> and this is, this is a very, very difficult relationship whereby everyone, of course, knows what the other party knows, what the other party knows. And there is no other way around. But everyone wants to, and particularly when you're outside, it is very easy to suggest that you can cut the risk. Because in as much as it remains inside the box, which is Ukraine, in, inside the perimeter of Ukraine, which is the key point of the Western strategy nowadays, which reflects in the manner in which the weapons are supplied, etc., in every single detail. Um, it's just it's possible to think like that when you're outside, but it is totally impossible to think like that when we are inside. <laughs> and when we, ha when we face, it is not... A, 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 when I was trying to suggest this idea that we, every war has its own definition, it's not only legal, it's all sorts of cultural things that I tried to touch upon as well. Uh, the historical background behind that. Uh, it is important that uh, uh, this whole situation in this specific context is that we are faced with a uh, 
enemy, which is in, uh, it's not like a war for some material assets, you know, like we need this peninsula, we need this isthmus, whatever, we need to, that, whatever, our, our ships go this way or that way, or we need a little bit more oil, you know, or something like that. It's not the war for resources, it is the war for the entire, entire thing. This is a war in total denial of Ukrainian sovereignty, of its ethnic, cultural, whatever identity. It is a genocidal war. And imagine, could you, for instance, suggest during, if you are in total external, which was not the case, I don't know how was total external during the Second World War, if someone would suggest that uh, if in order to stop the war in Europe, you need to elect a Jewish parliament, uh, a transitional one, who would negotiate with Hitler in order to stop the war, for instance. <laughs> it is exactly the same story with us. Nobody that would legitimately or semi-legitimately represent the Ukraine, Ukrainian nation you know, could negotiate a peace with an entity which is in total denial, which is graphically... Uh, one need to look at the situation on the occupation, occupi occupied territories. The atrocities committed uh, in the occupied territories, every, every village which has been freed has mass graves. <coughs> has mass graves with the, uh, clear signs of torture, of civilians, uh, of combatants. Uh, people are buried with their... Uh, with their limbs twisted, with their skulls broken, uh, women, children, complete families sometimes. Who do you talk to? How ne to negotiate with a party which is, which is so, so invested into, into such things? You know, it's, it's impossible. The only thing which is possible I, uh, is that uh, from the day one, there were so many attempts to negotiate. Because when our Western partners were still apprehensive of our weaknesses rather than strengths, uh, there was a movement towards negotiations. Ukraine went to Istanbul, there were meetings between the foreign ministers, etc. They all absolutely failed, of course, because there was nothing to, the, to discuss. It's like to discuss with the murderer, do you kill me tomorrow or today or whatever? <laughs> or let us postpone it for 10 days. <laughs> because the, the motivation for Russia nowadays, for, Russia is really pushing, but not directly, without proposing any attractive, even similar uh, attractive point, and also simultaneously ranting all these genocidal things in, by various media, it is somehow promoting uh, via mediators an idea that let's talk. The whole idea about us being bombarded right now, and particularly with the focus on the energy grid right now, yeah, Kiev is rolling on and now complete for several days blackout, you know, and it's terrible. I, I, I just somehow managed to, to leave the place uh, like a couple of days before, you know. So I'm not really apart, but I'm coming back and uh, I'll be there, you know. Uh, but we talk now to, it's, it's really, uh, let's leave it aside, my impressions. But uh, the, the point is the whole thing about uh, really, which is a war crime, it's a clear war crime, absolutely. Eliminating the c civilian infrastructure is, is again a war crime and a very expensive one economically because the reparations and compensation for that are running a huge bill. And every, every move like that, and all the moves that they did, it's already, money-wise, already almost an impossible figure. At, at, at one point of time, it's, built, it's, it, it's gonna be a figure more higher than the price of the whole Russian economy, if they go this way. But they continue to go this way because they run up themselves against the wall. And now they put this pressure, why? Because they want negotiations, they want to fix the situation, why? Because they want to rebuild their army and to have another, another, another helping of this. And there is, we don't see any other, 
uh, any other um, ideas behind this this whole thing. The only thing which is happening right now, there is certain brewing and certain shaking and tectonic things going on inside Russia. And anything that happens on the, everything that is going to happen or happens for in the at least short, I hope not midterm, but short term perspective, is being decided only on the battlefield. Therefore, the military aspects of this whole situation are the key and the most important ones. The understanding of the military dynamics, which we may address, I've, I just didn't have enough time to address, are, are really setting up the whole thing. He, uh, when a certain amount, we have su succeeded largely, but not yet decisively. If there is a more decisive amount of success, <coughs> Only then we can talk to the other party. We are not supposed to change their uh, mindset, their funky ideas about what is Ukraine, you know, their bizarre ideas about what is Europe, about, by the way, I, would, I wanted to cite one document, which I read, the Russian uh, document, uh, supposedly slightly classified, but I had a chance to read it, about <laughs> their, their policies that was in the run-up to the, to, the, to the war on their China policies, a thick document like that. They're, they're really talking about the decline of the West, you know, they're really invested into this idea that um, uh, Russia is going to be a nation country, you know, and they have bizarre ideas about the world, you know, very bizarre ideas, you know. But uh, these ideas aside, it is only the capacities uh, in negotiations, every negotiations, including uh, Israeli-Palestinian negotiations or any other negotiations. It is not so, it is important, but not as much, uh, not the ideology or the ideas, bizarre a bizarre, realistic or bizarre, you know, of the, of the parties that are involved, but the capacities and their potential. We don't have a true, they didn't not really grasp the idea that at this political level, the decision-making level, that they are already defeated. We, are, we have not really won yet, but they certainly are defeated. For us, the challenge is whether, with their defeat, they will take us along with them to hell, <laughs> or, or we still somehow survive and they go where they are. Because the track is, the trajectory is going for them this way. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, one short question. I'd like to open it up for the public as well. Uh, and this is about an especially the grim picture that you paint of the kind of genocidal war that this has uh, turned out to be. Um, what has uh, the can uh, Ukraine's candidacy for EU accession brought in terms of immediate benefits? Because I also keep reading that this is a long process. There are conditions mm -hmm. attached to accession. So what has the candidacy brought with it? Is it a symbolic kind of uh, pat in the back a gesture or is it more? Depends on the perspective. Mm -hmm. If you look from the um, Olaf Scholz perspective, it is symbolic. Like you said, for us it's uh, at least an acknowledgement of a huge effort that in, has been invested into this whole European idea since the on, from the onset. You know, from from once Ukraine becomes independent, uh, when no one really listened, and uh, the European Union, uh, for the most of this time, was in denial even of. Uh, uh, the European identity of Ukraine and it's right to it's right to apply, you know. And finally, uh, we have just like one job over it, you know, because as you said, the process has different kind of stages. That's what the Arabs would call manazil, you know, al <laughs> like the Sufis. Yes, my. <laughs> and in this particular station of this long way, it's like we jumped over when. <laughs> A section of this very long route, you know. In terms of practicalities, uh, we can only survive uh, through the uh, deeper integration with the European markets. And it is not like we're going to be feeding on whatever. You're, it is absolutely a mutually beneficial kind of arrangement. Mm -hmm. 
it's absolutely uh, good. Like, like you see, for instance, as a very little example of the energy grid, you know, we have managed to connect our energy grid finally to the European integrated fully into the Europe, right before all this thing started. Mm -hmm. It was because Ukraine is uh, producing extra energy. The, the energy has been from the onset desired as, uh, uh, as having a great surplus, almost up to 50%. And we were exporting energy very nicely to, to the European Union countries, you know. This is just one point, you know. Then there comes grain, there comes other things. There comes uh, comparative uh, uh, various markets, dimensions, you know, which... Uh, uh, and then now there comes also the military industries. The only way that we, uh, because uh, whatever happens to Russia, and there are very different scenarios, none of them good, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will have to uh, put up a system, an, a new European uh, infrastructure, uh, security infrastructure, uh, of which the military interest is, is an important part. And it can only work now that we know we have this experience only as integrated with uh, the European countries as well. You know, so on the practical side, it's, there is no other way to, to go about it. Alex and Suda, can I can I open the floor for questions yes. from the floor? Yes, just about to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. And I, um, I'm Tom Milo. I, I, I was uh, um, I studied Slavic languages, slipped into Turkology and later Arabic. Mm -hmm. And actually, as an officer, I served in the peacekeeping operation in South Lebanon. Mm -hmm. And from there, I have the practical observation that the word peace needs definition. Definition. Uh, you know the word salam, uh, uh, which yeah. is of course uh, cognate to sure. shalom. That is the piece where you don't like your opponent and kill him. It is the piece where the opponent has been defeated. And you know the expression salam nefsek, surrender. Mm -hmm. There is another word salam for... Is Islam is, Islam, yes. Islam is actually <laughs> imposing. Yeah. It's like pacification. And mm -hmm. you know, Pax Arabica, Pax Romana, Pax mm -hmm. Sovietica, they don't... Uh, denote situations that have been accomplished by negotiations, uh, by mutual understanding. It's extreme violence that wipes out the opposition. Absolutely. And there's another word in Arabic for peace, sulh. Sulh. And as, an, as, a, as a military negotiator, we knew that we were in, uh, technically in an in a amaliyat lil hifaz ala salam. But there was no such a thing. We could only, in, in eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball meetings with the parties, sulh was the only tenable thing. Now, how does this port to your situation? There will be no sulh with the Soviets, so uh, or, or with the ex... With the, sulh is like a negotiated peace based it's on like mutual truce, interest. Yeah, negotiated truce, rather. It, it's, yeah, it's translated as truce, but actually in the dictionary it's just another word for peace. peace and, yes, and, and, yeah. and the thing is that we have in our thinking about re the religions are always flirting with peace, mm -hmm. the peace movements, but you, it's never, nobody ever takes the trouble to define what exactly they mean with peace, but given the fact that, that there's such a fundamental difference between peace and peace, which in Arabic is crystal clear, it's either salam or Sulh. Anyway, that's one observation. I will come back later with another comment. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm collecting more questions. <coughs> Good point. Interesting. I have a rather specific question. We had the Minsk agreements in the, after the, the invasion in 2014. Mm -hmm. The Russians didn't take their part of the agreements, but this was one part of the agreement was should it be done by Ukraine. It was changing the constitution to make decentralization a kind of self-rule in the Donbass region. Mm -hmm. Why does that didn't happen? And could it be a part of a future peace agreement? Uh, shall I? Yeah, please. Let's talk yeah. about it. Yeah. Uh, starting from your question about Minsk. Uh, uh, you know... In those days that the Minsk Agreement has been put up, it was a stopgap thing uh, for, for us to stop the war and to achieve what the previous speaker has formulated in Arabic as sulh. It was a sulh agreement, the Minsk Agreement, but not the peace agreement. It was a temporary solution. If you look at the text of this agreement, uh, you'll find that it's, it's kind of like bullet point thing, and if you really start thinking to that, they just don't match each other, all these bullets, you know. The whole idea, it, it allowed for uh, a Russian interpretation 
an aggressive interpretation and uh, for Ukrainian interpretation uh, a defensive one. And the cross point between them was, as it appeared, just unachievable. Uh, the, uh, it ultimately, the, the Russians demanded that we would uh, give an autonomy to the occupied area which was in full control of the enemy and also to allow this area to become part of the uh, U Ukrainian power system. It was something that would very clearly undermine the whole thing. It's like I would say, uh, if, for instance, uh, there is, uh, like, um, uh, let's compare it, for instance, this most uh, well-known conflict to everyone, the Israeli-Palestinian one. Uh, it was like to suggest that there is a territory which would possibly, during the two-state solution, become part of the Palestinian state, but now it is Zone C under Israeli control, and also it, it has settlements where the Israeli settlers live, and this area becomes autonomous, and all these people, including the Israeli settlers, become part of the Palestinian administration authority and are electing the president of Palestine. <laughs> Something like that. It's an absolutely impossible thing to agree. The reason why... Uh, I, 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 I have a difficulty to say. I know that was the under previous administration. I am the political appointee of the new administration, <laughs> so to say. But I'm, uh, I, 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 I say that that was really a mistake. And I'm saying that not because I was appointed to my position by the current President Zelensky. <laughs> And I, uh, I have many things to say about the president, uh, President Poroshenko, the previous one, but I think he made a blunder to go for Minsk II agreement. I think that was his, uh, and, and he, did, he did go to this blunder. He took this decision in my mind because he is not a politician but a businessman. This is a business logic. Uh, businessmen do make agreements with uh, whosoever and when in as much as they know that uh, uh, nothing hurts me I make no losses and the time might work in my favor they do a lot of such things and I think that was an agreement of that sort it is absolutely impossible and now it's absolutely obsolete because there is no such thing as the people of Donbass it's just an area you know it's a people of uh, this part of Amsterdam uh, as opposed to that part of Amsterdam. <laughs> there is no identity to it, nothing at all, you know. Above all, nothing to give Minsk autonomy to, you know. Above all, the Minsk agreements allowed Putin to feign that he's not involved in the war, that Russia has no state. Yes, above all, yes, absolutely. Thank you, thank you, Mike. This is most important, because this agreement gave certain preferences and advantages to the enemy. It allowed for Russia to frame itself as a peace builder. Because this agreement was supposedly signed uh, or uh, should have been resolved, this whole, uh, according to this agreement, not with Russia as a country at war with Ukraine, but with so-called separatists. There is no such thing. This is a made-up construct. These are the proxies created by Russia. You know what really happened? Because I talked to some people who really took part in this whole process of negotiating. You know how Russians called these proxies privately? among themselves. They call them животные, enemy, uh, animals. Zveri. They spoke, they really spoke, in the backdoor negotiations, you know, in the, what they call, uh, unofficial part, they spoke, Russians spoke to Ukrainian side, differently represented through this whole period. They agreed about certain things, such as the exchange of war prisoners, etc. And then at some point, some of the Russians would say, no, let's call the, an the animals in. That's how it operated. <laughs> yeah. This dehumanizing <laughs> talk, of course, also brings us back to the question of nuclear missiles that might be used at one point. There was much talk about that when Putin is using the words. And obviously, if you have complete, if you have despise for your enemy, there might also be the option of bringing it down in a Hiroshima-Nagasaki fashion. Absolutely. What do you say about that? 
Yes, talking about the nukes, uh, of course, the nuclear blackmail has been used intensely and still is somehow on the table. And uh, I, I'm not going to commit an act of sorcery and, and say that no or yes or percentage-wise. It didn't happen ever since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The strongest uh, possibilities is for, for it not to be repeated again. Uh, but that, assuming that the Russians essentially, for all their political, political and historical bizarre ideas, remain rational. They do remain rational. The choices that they make, although we don't like them, are rational, explainable. And rationally speaking, uh, it just doesn't make much sense. If you took it from the operational perspective, uh, from the pure military, what I read from the military experts, uh, there is no experience of use of so-called tactical weapons. No one really studied that. It never really happened. And uh, uh, looking at how botched the uh, military operation is on the Russian side, uh, it is absolute, and now that they also lost their professional army to a large extent, uh, they have lost most of their mm, professional soldier force and the officer force, the petty officer force. Uh, they will not be able to handle the situation after the use of tactical weapons in the theater. It will be a disaster, as is very often their operations on the ground. Uh, this is on the, on the practical side. Uh, what they achieve, uh, they are now in retreat. They are incapable of uh, logistically maintaining a force larger than, than 150,000. However, how, whatever the numbers that they mobilize, they just lo logistically, and their opportunities logistically are dwindling. They are less and less. Wars are not won by rocket strikes. This war, and it has been analyzed by military experts in this way, there is a lot of literature already about that, that many hopes that the uh, Western NATO military experts had for the technology somehow making the wars different from before. Uh, I actually read a book which was in denial of this ideology in the run-up of the war, accidentally produced by the by RUSI, uh, Royal United Services Institute. It was called this book, the booklet, the several articles put together, uh, uh, The Necessary Heresies. This book was written in denial of this idea that we may, as NATO did, reduce armies, we don't need so many soldiers, we, uh, we will have a lot of UAVs, you know, and they will be flying everywhere, you know, and, and robotics and whatnot, you know, and everything will be on the computer, something like that. That was the idea, okay? Now we see that the masses are more important than anything else. The artillery is still important, the classical tanks, although, of course, technologically more advanced, the more advanced the better, are also important. The physical force is important because this kind of war is about taking territories. How do you take territories? By uh, making it unusable. It will be unusable. What's the point? So I'm passing so the it micro just makes no sense. I'm that. passing the micro now to more people with questions. But this is only if Russians are really, are really truly uh, rational. Are they? Is an open question. Right. I suppose my question is along that direction as well. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'll be honest, I was kind of surprised by the whole conflict when it, when it started, when there was uh, the build-up. I was kind of, this is saber-rattling, this is going nowhere. Um, and what I don't really understand, I don't, even like in a best-case scenario, Russia gets what it wants. What, what is the, the real benefit here? Why not, why not play nice with the West and send your kids to London to do cocaine and have a good time and uh, sell your oil and have a good time? I, um, I, I, even in the best-case scenario, I don't really see what Russia hopes to gain with this. Even you get Ukraine, okay, great. Um, so do you really think it's... Because to me it seems irrational. You, you think they are rational, but I, I don't really see any sort of rational benefit to this compared to just playing nice and getting along with the West. So do you really think it's just returning to some sort of like imperial ambition and ego stroking on Putin's behalf or oligarch friends or anything like that? Thank you. Yeah. 
it's all sorts of things together, you know, and that's why I also I, I left the question mark whether or not they're rational. I myself made a mistake because we made an analysis in the run up to the war, and uh, uh, this analysis apparently, when, uh, you know, one of the points that we made, it's not only us but other branches, even the commander in chief, there was a, a National Security and Defense Council meeting at which certain things are also very similarly discussed, you know. Uh, like, the military idea of an invasion like that is that uh, it is not enough for 200,000 troops, and on the practical, uh, pr practically less, because it includes logistics, it includes all sorts of things. Uh, and militarily, uh, in order only to occupy the easternmost part of Ukraine, uh, the calculation goes up to 400, uh, for, 450,000 at least. Uh, uh, Russia would have needed uh, upward from 1 million soldiers, uh, not considering logistics and officers, etc., and all this, to occupy the entire perimeter if it wanted. But it went into this operation. Uh, uh, Rationality and uh, stupidity, you know, they are not just like black and white things, you know, they blur into each other. And they were rationally uh, building our, well, let's say, plan in this operation upon an irrational idea, you know, because the foundation was irrational. They had an irrational reading and assessment of the social and political reality of Ukraine. And why their understanding of Ukraine was irrational? Because they neglected uh, the facts. They neglected uh, the need for a, a thorough study before you do something. Uh, they were building their assumption, uh, their, their, their operations, their strategy upon, upon assumption, upon uh, stereotypes, not upon a, a really thorough study. And also upon information which was supposedly designed as thorough, coming from their intelligence, but which, in fact, was not, which was not, was also fed into the decision-making heads because they liked it, you know, and it was a social kind of game, you know. So but the quick surrender of Ukraine projection that you yeah, also quoted absolutely. from German uh, politicians. Yes. Would also, you please, also please say German, your name? Yeah. Alexandra. Alexandra. Yep. Alexandra. Yep. Great. Um, I have a question about Crimea. So I had a discussion. No, it's not on. Yep. Can I have this one? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry for that. No, so I had the discussion today with a political science student from uh, Kiva Mahilanska Academia University, and uh, we were discussing um, reintegration of um, certain regions when they were when they will be deoccupied and we were focusing on Crimea. So basically Ukraine will gain back a region which is to a significant extent um, populated by people who moved from Russia. Probably like not I won't say they are a majority but a significant extent probably. And we discussed that this situation might be a bit similar to what uh, occurred after the Second World War in terms of there was a, a lot of uh, deportations and forced movement, but then um, what are your thoughts on how Ukraine will deal with that problem of having, of, of getting back regions um, yeah, with this, uh, like, reintegrating, right? Yes, yeah. basically, yeah. Yeah, that's really a challenge. Militarily we do need to do that, and probably will. Ben Hodges, for one, is very optimistic in terms of us having deoccupied Crimea by the end of the year or maybe the early next year. Uh, it is very likely that uh, it will happen for purely operational reasons. Uh, Russia has dwindling capacity to defend the line between this floating front in, in the south. But then there comes the, the challenge of reintegrating the populations, etc. Uh, of course, uh, there is also information. I don't know the final figure, but uh, there are various sources quote absolutely different figures. But apparently, there is an operation, uh, an ethnic cleansing thing going on in Crimea and elsewhere in the occupied territories. 
uh, they are now, for instance, in the occupied territories, they are forcibly deporting uh, various populations. Uh, that also includes uh, such an apparent uh, war crime uh, or even an act of genocide as stealing children in big numbers, you know. And, uh, but they're forcing people to live. They're trying to depopulate certain areas, but in Crimea, uh, which they peacefully grabbed, they also uh, <coughs> brought, brought in, they operated with Crimea not only as with a uh, legal Russian, a part of Russian Federation, but they also specifically stimulated the incoming um, flow of the populations from, from Russia. Uh, and they, they, were, they were doing, uh, they, they initially they relied on the public officials who they inherited from the Ukrainian um, authorities at various posts, and then they were substituting them for the Russian cadre. That goes also for the military, of course, primarily, but, but mainly, but at every level of the government administration, they were bringing in new cadre. They were also bringing in others for any important positions of authority. And there is quite a lot of people who just came in. And they put up incentives for people to move, and people had their own incentives to move in and to buy real estate in Crimea, for instance, because uh, they really believed into Crimea is forever. They put up this idea of Crimea is forever Russia, you know. It's so, so, many people, so many people really bought into this idea, and they, on their own, I believe many of them also, been stimulated in this specific way, went into Crimea and settled there. So there's quite a lot of people, of true Russian citizens, not of those who were forced to take Russian passports or chose to do that, but mainly they were forced because they were, uh, for, the, for those who were citizens of Ukraine and then they continued to live there and, and didn't leave Crimea, there's also quite a few of them who left for various, in various situations at various times. But for these people who still are in Crimea and uh, uh, who, people who came in from Russia, it's an open question. They are legally have no right to be in Ukraine. They illegally entered the country. And they, they, they should be sent back. It is very difficult to handle such, uh, as it is, has been stated, up to several hundred thousand, like 200,000 maybe. For, someone said that it is 400,000 of such people. Probably these figures are, I believe, inflated a little bit, but they are quite substantial. And, but I, I hope this can be handled legally without, without the use of force. Uh, also, if and when the Ukrainian army will be coming into Crimea, and even now already, there are reports and anecdotal evidence of people who are in such position, they already on their own go into, back to home, you know. How many of them, I don't know, but there is such traffic. Yeah. The mic is with the gentleman over there. Do you have a green light on your button? Now I have a green light, yes, thank you. My name is Peter. Um, I had hoped to learn from you as a military expert how it came to be that Basically, the big country, Russia, is being defeated by the small country. We have some ideas of ourselves by observing what we read in the newspaper and for concluding, for example, that it seems that Russia from day one in this war violated all the teachings of Sun Tzu. But I like to hear your opinion on what happened that Ukraine actually is winning this war. Though they have not yet won, but they have not been defeated in the way everybody expected it to happen. Yeah. Uh, there are multiple answers, multiple facets to the issue, to this situation. Uh, primarily, it was a strategic uh, blunder. Uh, because they really banked on uh, Ukraine being uh, far worse than it is. They also miscalculated the uh, pure military capacity. Uh, uh, they faced a situation uh, in 2014 uh, where Ukraine almost had no army or had an army which was not loyal, had an army uh, 
in a way similar to the army that Putin has built himself in Russia. The army that goes uh, to the military for the lack of other choices. <laughs> yeah. The army uh, which goes for the military to, have been paid, to, to be paid salary but not to fight. Uh, Russia has such army nowadays, in fact, to a large extent, not all <laughs> Russian army, because there are dedicated forces, there are special forces, many of them, but they who has been killed already, and many of them are out. Uh, so that was a, a military miscalculation. Uh, there was a political strategic calculation on the part of the political authorities in Russia, which means Putin and his gang. And there, is, there was a military miscalculation on the part of the general staff of the Russian Federation, uh, because Ukraine managed, and this is, uh, I take it as a very good sign of the vitality of the Ukrainian nation, because so much blame was put on Ukraine for the weakness of its institutions, for its, for its, for its failures in the fight with the corruption, for its failures with what not, you know, for its uh, incompletion of some uh, homework uh, offered by the European Union, or I don't know what. But in a matter of just eight years, we have managed to build up a very powerful military, which is arguably better than many NATO militaries. <laughs> uh, we have learned a bit uh, from the NATO expertise, which was made available. There was training programs, etc., going on. Uh, our officers, such as Zaluzhny primarily, but some others as well, less known people, uh, the ones who went through the experience of the eight years of Simran military conflicts in, in, the, in Donbass, uh, they were eager readers and absorbers of various things. They really, they really managed to reform themselves you know, in many different ways, also mentally you know, and professionally. We have, uh, uh, Russia has done something similar before when they bumped into the situation with the Georgian war, you know, they realized that their army is obsolete, then there was a reform, so-called Serdukov reform, you know, they were trying to bring themselves up to effectively something similar to the NATO standards, but, but they failed. The Russia failed in this because it is truly, really very corrupt including the military, and Ukraine succeeded because with all our deficiencies we have had a very strong uh, motivation. Nothing motivates better than the, the desire to survive, because that was the only way for us collectively or individually to survive. And people were really very much invested. You know this, uh, for instance, this uh, so-called volunteer movement, the people who helped the army with, it still continue to help the army with all sorts of things. The crowd, crowdfunding which is going on for different things. The whole society has invested into that. Not just the professional military. No. Yeah. And, ultimately, actually, Suda, and then we have more a, questions a, here from the public. Yeah, exactly. I had a comment about that, actually, the, the wide-scale resistance. Uh, in fact, it's not just the military, but it's the fact that uh, I can't remember any other hi recent historical precedent in which so many people from cross-sections of society have signed up mm -hmm. uh, and have talked up their role in the war and in their resistance against the Russians. So I think that has been, the, the public morale has been quite uh, strengthened by that. But I also wanted to quickly say, in response to the question about are Russians rational, I think it's not so much really what we think of what they do, but it's the fact that they've built an industry of making their acts seem rational. So there is an enormous kind of intellectual tradition of um, talking up the importance of the Russian Empire, of seeing this as their historical right, which has been going on for decades. So this isn't just the ravings and rantings of one man. This is the, the consequence yeah, so of a very large political, cultural, military industry that has worked together. Uh, and I think we have more questions as well at the back. Yeah, thank you so much for your discussion. Um, I, I have one... Um, Okay, I wanted to ask you about sort of, yeah, you already referred to the end of the war. Um, and this is, I mean, I was at, at discussions in uh, in February already where, where everyone was just saying, okay, we have no no off-ramps, no, uh, no ending scenario for this war, which makes, makes it even more, you know, worrying. Um, 
in, in my idea, at least, it has a lot to do with, with the, the fact that, that Russia is, is such a large nuclear power. Um, so, yeah, and, and if you think about how, how a war ends, if you are invaded and then you, you kick them out, and then what can typically happen is you pursue Napoleon back to Paris or Hitler back to Berlin, and yeah, right. um, then the war ends. Um, that doesn't seem to be a scenario with Russia right now. So what's, what's your impression? What would happen if Ukraine conquers back its own territory? Uh, what stops Russia from continuing to undermine uh, in various ways or to still shoot rockets? Um, yeah, what's, yeah just saying, again, yeah. what constitutes peace, I guess? Yeah. We have arrived, uh, uh, really, we have arrived uh, to the definition of, uh, of victory. Uh, we know what the victory is about, and you have mentioned that. We even uh, finally reached a consensus with our Western partners. They also agree that this is how it should be. Uh, we need to restore the borders, etc. There is an official list of these things and even Russia needs to pay reparations, etc. You know, there is a presidential statement about that, which more or less reflects, with some qualifications, the very broad consensus with NATO and non-NATO countries who support us. You know, this is a commonsensical thing. But uh, truly, uh, there is far more a problem with the definition of peace. How peace would will look like. And it is somehow outside of the perspective. I was proposing, uh, internally, I proposed a discussion at this seminar, which I mentioned, and the Institute. And I was also, I was not completely satisfied with what I heard from my colleagues as well. And I will probably be going to, soon to the NATO HQ as part of the delegation from various ministries, and uh, I'm looking forward for the opportunity to try and provoke them about this too. This <laughs> might not have a chance as well, because it's difficult in such settings. So we have time for one more question. Uh, it is really, it is difficult, but uh, I would say just one thing to say very broadly. In every conflict, conflicts stop because uh, become like frozen and even for a very long time or without the parties making friends with each other or whatever upon one condition when the internal dynamics of the uh, a negative piece okay when the internal dynamics of the parties are stronger than the external dynamics between themselves we have such situation of bad peace between Palestinians and Israelis it's nothing like 1967, 1973, right? People suffer, but there is no open war between the whole of the Arab world and Israel, with the support of Americans, the Brits, the Hunover, like it was before. Uh, the, the internal and uh, aggressive dynamics inside Russia are also simmering. And it may become the case that ultimately Russians will fight each other and will somehow. <laughs> uh, thank you for a uh, very interesting discussion. I was wondering if you could give us some more insight about the Global South and your discussion with them, because I've, I was in Latin America in the spring, and I noticed that a lot of countries in the so-called Global South are lean very much towards, if not entirely towards Russia. I mean, the leader of Pakistan was smiling with Putin on the same day of the invasion or a few days afterwards. So if you could say something about that. Yeah, they, uh, different things, you know. There's this history, really, uh, I tried to quote this guy. I may return to the slide. This is about like when they talk, they, they have a whole powerful discourse, anti-colonial, anti-imperialistic discourse in these countries, and these discourses continue to shape their political thinking, you know, for, and it will continue to shape for a very long time. And it doesn't really matter whether it was the Communist Party of Egypt, which is now out, or the Islamic movement of whatnot, you know, which is 
just the other day was the biggest threat for the West, supposedly. Uh, they, they are essentially on the same plate. They, they think about the West very similarly. And uh, very often you will find that members of the royal family in Saudi Arabia, which is one of the US strongest supposedly allies, you know, speak the same language of jihad about the United States. And there are even quotations now, recently quoted, you know, when there was, uh, there were some misunderstandings between the Biden administration and the MBS regarding the prices of oil, okay? Uh, uh, they are anti-colonial, uh, but this colonialism is really something that should be understood not as an abstract idea, but a specific lived experience. They have built their identities about a certain understanding of the world where places like Ukraine just very difficult to formulate. We're, we're, we're meaningless. To if that. I may briefly interrupt, we also have something like an international league of right-wing authoritarian regimes that understand each other pretty well, say Modi and Putin. Could yes. That be? Yes. Yes. So yes. it's they're not fighting for the same values, maybe. Uh, can I intervene on yeah, this please. one? Sure. <laughs> no, I mean, with, with India, I can tell you that it is practically impossible to persuade left-thinking Indians of the fact that the Soviet project was a colonial project. This is not a conversation I can have. It just doesn't fly for them. left-leaning Indians. So I think the idea, as you say, of the, the Soviet Union as being this multi-ethnic, multi-national project, which was comparable to India, mm. that has held on and that has endured. And so it's impossible for uh, people who believe that there should be no war to actually see the Soviet Union as and the Russian precedent as being that of an aggressor. That's, that's yeah, just that, so, so resilient, that idea. At some point during the crucial time, uh, there was a decision passed by the Central Committee of the Communist Party, uh, but the idea came from the KGB to try and use the independence movement as a proxy for the Soviet expansion. It really was a success. During the Cold War, it was one of the successes of the Soviet Union to invest into anti-colonial movements across the globe. And they have established all sorts of overt and covert links with multiple various entities, organizations, and individuals, and build up a very strong base. Uh, in every uh, African, Arab, and Asian country where it was uh, relevant. Every post-colonial settings, you know, there is an investment through bringing people and f uh, giving them free education, uh, higher education, you know, there. Until now, there are clubs of the graduates, the alumni of Russian universities, which also sadly includes uh, people very often who studied in Ukraine and in Uzbekistan <laughs> and in everywhere else. So it's a whole enterprise. They have invested into that through decades. When you, you know, uh, the, uh, the framework of you being part even of a um, talk show, you know, it's very limited, in fact, you know. It's very difficult to discuss these bulky, difficult ideas. I had a chance to, I had a conference organized by a French uh, journalist based now in Jordan, and we had a Zoom conference uh, for the journalists. It's like a kind of education seminar or something like that. Then I brought up a few things. Uh, also, like the other question was about the military, for instance. There is an important thing that many don't know uh, about the failures of the Russian army. Uh, cultures matter, uh, backgrounds matter, and in the Soviet army and also in the Soviet military technical cooperation with the colonial, post-colonial world, Ukrainians played a huge role. I'm afraid we have to... <laughs> Honor our promise to the co workers of Spy 25 to evacuate the room at <laughs> half past six. Um, there is a famous book that is called Everything Was Forever Until It Was oh, No yes. More. And that is a reflection of the belief that the Soviet Union would continue forever and develop, of course, socialism. And at one point, it all falls apart. And what we heard today is, of course, a reflection, a reflection of exactly that. Namely, we think of Putin, of, of, of uh, post-Soviet Russia, as something that is on its trajectory. But we hear of tectonic shifts and, of course, major challenges that are obviously concentrated here in the war in Ukraine and where Ukraine seems to be the trigger 
for many things that affect Russia. And in war times, the most important thing is communication and knowledge, information. And at at this point, we only can gather, we can only try to put things together that uh, come from different sources in times of, um, of informational warfare from all sides. Right? And I think a meeting like today was especially important for us to understanding, for understanding the Ukrainian side of it. Alex, thank you very much for being here. Suda, thank you very much for being the discussant.